University of Virginia and uh, Princeton, and he's taught at a ton of places, uh, including Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Syracuse, Parsons, Washington, Springs, <coughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> um, he's worked on a project um, with one of our faculty, Landry Smith, uh, Rising Currents, which was exhibited at uh, MoMA PS1, and today we will be talking about adapting New York City for climate change. Please join me in welcoming Adam Nancy. Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me all right? Is the uh, my yeah. voice being projected? Uh, a little bit louder. A little bit louder? OK. All right. Maybe move the microphone. Ah, OK. How's that? Good? OK. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Julia. And thank you to Tom and Tom as well for coordinating. It's very easy to uh, remember names here. Um, and it's great to be here. Uh, also, um, one of our recent former employees, Will Smith, is a alumnus of your program, so that uh, was an attraction to come here and see what kind of institution could create uh, Will Smith, so very happy to be here at the source um, in a positive way, not like a monster or anything like that, no. Um, so I'm going to be talking tonight uh, primarily about three projects um, and then reflecting upon some of the implications that they have had for uh, our practice as well as um, uh, for ongoing um, our process, approach to work. Um, and the theme of the conference really, uh, one of the um, uh, you know, kind of points in the, in the brief for the conference was about changing environmental conditions, you know, reaching a crisis point, uh, and that large scale responses can take years to have any effect, and so how do we respond? So this work really uh, starts to point the way toward that. Uh, this is a map of global temperatures for 2015, which broke the record for prior um, uh, temperatures on the globe. And in fact, 15 of the 16 hottest temperatures on record in the world have happened in this century, so the last 15 years. So it's a, the crisis point, of course, is are the implications of this, which is um, rising sea levels and also increased frequency of storm surges, at least in coastal context, and then severe weather and patterns happening elsewhere. So I'm going to be focusing on the implications in the New York City, um, primarily New York City um, area, uh, has to have to do with more water than, uh, than, than drought or, or fire and high temperatures. So um, this is one of the implications. This is a photograph, famous photograph taken by Ewan Bond after uh, uh, Superstorm Sandy when uh, Lower Manhattan was uh, without primarily, except for Battery Park City on a different, there on the Brooklyn power uh, line, was without power below about 30th, 4th Street, 30th Street. Uh, and so that's one of the implications. Uh, and then, of course, on a much smaller scale, um, or a, a more visible scale, the flooding, as well as loss of life, property, et cetera. So these projects, um, we began thinking about um, the impact of rising sea level on the city uh, in 2006 with a competition entry that we won for the History Channel's a competition called The City of the Future. We then uh, worked as part of a collaborative team, and I'll talk about that as well with um, others on a proposal for a new master plan for the upper harbor of New York and New Jersey called Palisade Bay. And then finally, a project called the New Urban Ground, which we developed with Catherine Sievit, who I know came here and lectured um, earlier this year in January, right? So, um, and, and uh, I'm sorry, not, uh, Catherine was part of Palisade Bay. Uh, Susanna Drake was our collaborator on New Urban Ground. And the projects really track our own trajectory um, from a kind of land-based perspective on how to um, uh, uh, respond to rising water levels and storms to really uh, a perspective that was in the watershed itself, sort of a part of the entire process of water flow uh, f between land and water uh, in both directions. So, but this first project really is a hard uh, architectural uh, project. It was actually one week uh, charrette that we did um, and we were one of 10 teams that were invited to submit proposals for what uh, our vision of what Manhattan would look like in 2106, so 100 years in the future. And we took as our inspiration this amazing map of Manhattan that was done by Ed Burke Veal, who was a sanitary engineer, uh, uh, and it was from 1865, and looked at all of the areas of, of the original watercourses of lower Manhattan and wetlands, uh, actually the whole island of Manhattan, but this is a detail of it and then uh, as well areas of landfill, which are the areas in orange. And we postulated that 
in, uh, because of rising sea level by 2106, areas that are shown as wetlands in this veal water map would become flooded because they tend to be the low-lying areas. And so our, our graphics sort of show one area of the city which we focused on, which is actually very close to where our office is located, and the implication of an approximately three-foot water level rise at the time. This was very crudely mapped, but at the time we were doing this, uh, and, and a quick survey of information online, you know, three feet seemed like, wow, that's going to be the, that, that probably the most that could possibly happen. Of course, now we're looking at totals that could be six feet or more by that time. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And so what we wanted to do, though, was propose something um, that was, and notwithstanding this circumstance, optimistic with respect to the perpetuation of the city in, in, on this island and in these waterfront locations. And so we combined this notion of flooding in these areas, which are highlighted in the blue dashed circles, with an idea about the, the sort of street and the street grid in the city as being something very distinct to New York, kind of um, being a kind of characteristic of the the kind of the way that habitation ha occurred on the island. And of course, the street grid of 1811, um, which kind of rolled out this uh, you know, pattern uh, all the way north from roughly um, uh, uh, Houston Street, or approximately there, of, um, all the way to the end of Manhattan, more or less. And um, our premise was that within these low-lying areas, as individual property is flooded and foundations are undermined by this over time, uh, there would be a new form of construction which we called a vane, V-A-N-E, uh, named after the structure of a part of the feather of a bird that would occupy the public street rights of way in these spaces. So it's a, and those are a series of sections at the bottom of this kind of uh, reinforced concrete infrastructural pier, effectively, multi-story that could be programmed in different ways uh, depending upon um, local conditions or desires and, and could also be flexibly reprogrammed in the future. So a kind of long linear loft building, roughly 60 feet wide, projecting into these uh, watery edge conditions so that the characteristic density of the city could be, be uh, maintained if not even uh, uh, augmented in these waterfront zones, and that there would be this kind of new character to the city from the fact that it would be, begin to become sort of populated by this fringe of, um, of these sort of pier-like buildings. So the project was as much about um, uh, this kind of basic idea, uh, and then kind of within the limits of time we had to basically convey the, not just the kind of um, the fact that, that we were planning for this in these areas from a sort of site planning strategy, but also the kind of experiential qualities that this could have. So we part of the competition was that you had a four foot by four foot square footprint to create a model. That was the primary means of presenting the project as well as through animation. So um, we created an animation which showed kind of what it might be like to live in this part of the city or in these areas as well as this model which was lit with uh, an image of water that we photographed from uh, of the Hudson River kind of shimmering water and then built the model essentially at three different scales. These are some stills from the, from the video uh, of these renderings of these watery areas of the city the, the passing through coexisting in some places with existing structures and then this three-level model that was illuminated from the bottom and then had a mirror so that you were viewing the topmost level and the kind of compressed levels below it at three different scales, the bottom scale being the regional scale, 1 to 2,500, the middle scale being kind of urban scale at 1 to 500, and then 1 to 100, the sort of neighborhood scale, which interestingly, if any of you have been to the panorama at the Queens Museum in New York City, is the same scale as that. There's a giant panorama of the entire city of New York that was created for the World's Fair, which is at 1 to 100 scale. So this was like a sort of fragment of that in our, in our minds. And then the idea of viewing the image of this in a way, not only because the top level was above eye level, but then somehow you're seeing this constructed view uh, of the project as well as the physical model. The other thing we did, which used to be linked, that was a live link, and I noticed the other day you can't read anymore, but... Uh, we also wrote a narrative about the project that was written from the perspective of someone who was living at this time in 2106. So rather than writing a conventional project description, which would be saying, you know, the vein is six feet wide, it extends this, we basically just described at these three scales uh, life in, in this city in the future. So we won this competition, this um, leg of the competition, 
and it, it sort of that began our process of engagement with these conditions uh, in the city. Uh, immediately on the heels of this, we became part of a team that received the uh, Latrobe Prize, which is awarded by the College of Fellows of the AIA every two years for research. And uh, we were part of a, uh, this team that was led by Guy Nordenson, who's a structural engineer. Uh, Catherine Sievet was involved in landscape, our office, and then uh, Mike Tentow, who's a uh, GIS mapping expert, and then um, um, environmental uh, science uh, uh, faculty at Princeton. So this formed the kind of collaborative uh, nucleus of the work that I'm going to show you. Uh, at the time, and this actually, 2009 was when New York City first published their, published their first climate risk analysis. Uh, it's been updated uh, most recently in 2015, but it was really the first time the city ever uh, documented what was happening uh, in a condensed form so that it could begin to become used by other agencies and policymakers as well as citizens to understand the implications that rising sea levels would have for the city. So there's really a few things happening on the left. Those are some charts from that 2009 booklet. They've been updated subsequently, and the high-end ranges are a little bit higher now, as I described. But essentially, there's been an incremental rise. The top graph is at the Battery, the lower tip of Manhattan. There's been a rise in sea level over, over the last century. Um, this has led to both um, uh, the possibility of, and will lead to, as the water level rises further, the possibility of flooding, you know, tidal flooding, uh, some of which is happening elsewhere in cities like um, Miami and Norfolk, Virginia. New York City, uh, at least Manhattan, is surrounded by a, a, a sort of seawall that uh, has uh, prevents some of that day-to-day -day flooding as the tide uh, goes up and down. But... Um, at the same time, there's an increased frequency of stronger storms because the baseline water elevation is higher, and um, uh, and so therefore the there are more stronger storms, uh, and their effect is will be felt more strongly um, than they had been felt in the past. So those two charts show that all of this stuff is actually interesting. You, if you go to the Plan NYC website, they have a number of downloadable PDF publications that are free that describe climate risk and also a number of things the city has done over the last six or seven years um, uh, to begin to address this. So New York City is also, as we learned with uh, Sandy, uh, not um, immune to uh, hurricanes. Even though they're very different than those in the Gulf, they're not, they don't reach the same power level because the water is not as warm. But this is a tracking of a whole series of, of hurricanes that have passed by. Probably the most catastrophic recent hurricane was in the 1930s. It crossed Long Island and caused essentially a tsunami that took out a number of different um, uh, smaller towns. But, um, and, and tremendous devastation to the coast of Connecticut as well. But um, Sandy, which was not a hurricane at the time that it hit the city, was probably the, obviously the most recent uh, in memory in terms of power. So the proposition we had was to look at the upper harbor of New York and New Jersey, which is bracketed by those three lines, and to think about a different approach to um, responding to climate change uh, than um, has been kind of conventionally promulgated uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and we were reflecting upon the devastation that occurred in, in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina when all of these constructed systems failed and there, were really, there wasn't any redundancy and you had kind of catastrophic flooding. Um, and we wanted to think about soft engineering or techniques for, that would be more resilient than a simple, sort of single line of defense that was uh, you know, obviously um, entailed tremendous risk should that single line of defense fail. So uh, there had been a study, uh, there have been a couple of studies uh, prior to when we began work to look at doing flood barriers um, to uh, prevent uh, storm surge from entering the harbor. And that's a diagram showing the location of three flood barriers. These would be on the scale of the, the barrier you see here that's in Rotterdam. So massive uh, infrastructure. But um, what you might notice is that large areas of Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island wouldn't be within that area. So, so sorry, guys, but uh, Manhattan will be fine. <laughs> and the rest of you, not so good. So... Um, that was another small problem with this type of uh, approach. Uh, so we drew our inspiration from both ecology, that's a, a cross-section through a palisade, through a, the, the, um, uh, through a leaf uh, plant on the, right, on the left, your left, 
uh, and looking at palisade cells, which are these linear cells that are um, involved in the process of photosynthesis, and also the ge geology, uh, the, the palisades, which are a uh, rock structure along the western side of the Hudson River, um, beginning just at the northern tip of, of Manhattan on the New Jersey side of the, of the Hudson River and extending probably 20 miles or so north. At the same time, we were also interested in the Upper Harbor uh, in terms of its potential to become a kind of place, a kind of cultural place. So as Central Park was to Manhattan in the 19th century, the Upper Harbor could potentially be a, a new regional center uh, and a place uh, of its own right. And the image on the top left is the San Marco Basin uh, in Venice, which is this kind of place that you really feel quite strongly. It's a much smaller scale, of course. And then a view um, of the har partial view of the harbor, uh, Lower Manhattan, on the bottom left. So this kind of uniting of ecology and culture into to creating a new place. We began our process with um, historical mapping. This is a tracing. Uh, that's an image of the pre-European uh, settlement estuaries of the harbor and kind of our mapping of a whole series of uh, subsequent shoreline um, uh, changes through um, uh, charts, uh, nautical charts of the harbor. We also did um, mapping visually, uh, both on foot and through looking at Google Earth views of the existing conditions of the edges of the harbor, so the way in which the land meets the water. As I said, Manhattan is essentially encircled by a vertical seawall that uh, was put in for, which I'll describe when I talk about the next project, was put in for really commercial reasons, so you could pull a boat up to the side of the city. But other parts of the city have different uh, edge conditions, revetments, um, and um, uh, in some cases, soft conditions on landfill. And this was combined with GIS mapping to correlate um, data from both bath bathymetry, which is on the left, which is the uh, underwater topography, and also topography above ground, which is on, and this image on the right is a combination of bathymetry and topography on one drawing. That's really important. That hadn't been done before we did this work, and especially when you think about um, the notion of the water as something which can, can, can rise, you want to understand sort of what its extents are when it rises, and not think about water as a kind of filling a, a kind of pre- determined basin or, or um, uh, kind of uh, given uh, sort of size area, but actually something that can be quite fluidly moved beyond that and, and, and is, is a more dynamic condition. So that was important. That information was used to then map um, areas of potential flooding for different uh, uh, scales of hurricanes. So the map on the right is... Um, and to also assess damage that could be caused by that using software that was originally developed for earthquake damage analysis where um, all of the structures and infrastructure uh, have uh, data about their construction and, um, and you can begin to assess the impact that storms would have on those areas. So category one uh, hurricane is actually the green and two is yellow and three is orange. So it uh, just gives you a sense of kind of the extent of flooding that, that can occur. And Sandy, although it wasn't, it was catastrophic and, and shocking, was, um, again, not a hurricane and not crossing at the most dangerous location that one could cross, which would be th south of the city through northern New Jersey or Staten Island. We, we also, um, let's see. Uh-oh. Going to wait for the program to respond. There we go. Uh, we also did an atlas. So this is in a book that we um, uh, wrote uh, called Palace on the Water Palisade Bay. But we also did an atlas of the harbor, so to provide this information, uh, and then mapped onto uh, the areas that we um, that are in those squares, the 48 squares, uh, the. Uh, um, inundation that can occur under these different conditions. So this was part of the part of the work, documentation work, and the the result of this work was uh, a kind of planning framework for the harbor, which we called Palisade Bay, which essentially made a series of more resilient edges at the low lying land that um, fronted on the water, 
as well as a series of elements in the harbor and along the edges of the, of the water that could uh, slow down, create friction, and slow down uh, the force of a storm surge. A typical storm surge would enter at the bottom through the Verrazano Narrows, and then anything upriver, uh, if the storm surge is large enough and, and has significant velocity, could be dam severely damaged in the, in the wake of that. So these were some other ideas about integrating uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, oyster beds, other things that, again, to look at the full ecology of this, um, the harbor. And um, I'll be talking in more detail about lower Manhattan in a second. The other thing that we, this model could be, the GIS mapping could be used for correlated with the uh, uh, flood levels of different hurricanes was to look at just incremental sea level rise as well. So this is just showing a 10-foot inundation uh, and where the limits of that, and essentially the kind of green edged area that we created, you know, corresponds in some measure to that. And then other areas that have much more significant density or higher value, we actually are creating berms or ways of keeping that water out. <laughs> Coupled with this and related to the kind of cultural component of the project was the thought that we could have. Uh, a more extensive transportation network that would link both sides of the harbor. And we took as our inspiration the uh, water uh, buses that are in Venice and how you can have a very different experience of the Venetian island depending upon which bus route you take and whether it's skipping from side to side or you know, more of an express. So those are images of Venice on the, on the right. Uh, and um, there are, of course, some the ferries have become more um, popular in the city. There's always been the Staten Island Ferry, which is amazing. It's the best, it's still uh, 25 cents, I think. So it's the best tourist value, should you want to see an amazing experience of New York City. Uh, and then we proposed other elements, uh, these line of, um, of pier-like uh, islands in the center at a shallow area in the center of the harbor that might become a new population center, which would be linked by by these ferries as well. Governor's Island, which has become a park uh, more, more heavily visited than, than before. It used to be a uh, military base. So anyway, this kind of network of ferries uh, tying together both sides. And for a New Yorker in particular, this is somewhat you know, um, unconventional because we're used to seeing on our subway map kind of the gray area that's kind of amorphous to the, to the left, which is New Jersey. You know, you don't really, there's, that's another world. And so this is about sort of thinking about from the water outward as this place. Um, we then focused on lower Manhattan, specifically looking at how to create a more resilient edge and integrate that edge into the city, and also uh, a series of, of islands, breakwater islands, we called them, that would um, blunt the force of a storm surge that would approach from the south, as I said, through the Verrazano Narrows, um, and, and could you know, damage um, structures and, and cause extensive flooding as well in its wake. So we, we looked at a very simple building block um, using geotextile, uh, sediment-filled geotextile tubes, which is an existing technology that's used now. Uh, the Hudson River um, it, um, de deposits a great deal of sediment in the harbor, and that's dredged regularly in order to maintain navigable waterways. And there's a huge dredging project right now that's going on for larger boats that are going to be able to come to the harbor with the increased size of the Panama Canal. So there's a tremendous amount of dredge material available. And by stacking these geotextile tubes, uh, you can create uh, artificial islands. And then those islands can, because of their um, changing topography, can break up kind of the wave action of a storm surge. So this is just showing a sequence of island creation. We thought about these islands in a way as a kind of distortion and, and, and related to, but a sort of distortion of the scale of the urban blocks. Uh, and that, that might be a way of literally imparting a kind of, a kind of blurring of that boundary between uh, city and water in this location. And, and these are some planning diagrams of how to put those blocks in, as well as maintaining navigable waterways to and from the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. And, um, and in the rivers themselves, the East River and the, and the Hudson River. Um, and then we had another um, construction called the Breakwater Tower, which was a kind of bird haven that was not prone to um, gathering sediment in the same way as the islands that could be closer to the edges of these, of these navigable waterways. But the point of the island was actually that over time, you would create this nucleus out of these geotextile tubes. And then over time, 
there'd be also natural deposition of sediment due to the currents, and you begin to create this more dynamic condition uh, that, would, that would become something that could perpetuate itself. So this is looking at their real, all sorts of amazing resources online, and Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken across the Hudson from lower Manhattan has a uh, website that shows you current uh, Hudson River temperatures and flow and whatnot. Those are some stills from their website that show you um, the, the, the action of, of how, um, how the um, water flow changes with the tide. And then we tried to think about, this is super complicated to model and we weren't able to do it in a literal fashion um, because of the power of com even supercomputers are not yet up to doing this uh, with a great deal of, of speed. But basically looked at you know, how uh, island shape might begin to evolve from these uh, flow patterns in the harbor. We did use, uh, our, our Princeton colleagues um, did use um, computational fluid dynamic modeling to look at how a storm surge or, or, um, from a hurricane uh, would impact um, this area. They took a known hurricane, um, Hurricane uh, Isabel, which passed through uh, North Carolina, they moved that north so it crossed through Staten Island and then mapped uh, both water levels and velocity uh, on the harbor map that they made of, 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 of the harbor. And the point of that colored image on the upper right is basically just to show you that uh, an island there, that object we created there very crudely, uh, would have lower velocity. Red is the slower uh, velocity on its, um, you know, the uh, leeward side, I guess you'd call it, of the island. And this chart kind of maps that, the impact. So not surprisingly, these islands, you know, it kind of is common sense. They slow down things behind them. In order to get a little bit more feedback more quickly, we cr used a water table, which we borrowed from the University of Michigan, a kind of really cool uh, pre-computer um, technology where it puts a thin film of water. You can dye uh, uh, and then look at current flow passing through um, these island shapes. So we did a whole series of tests to begin to uh, iterate kind of shapes of islands and, and help qualify what these might be. I would say this is all highly conjectural, but it was still interesting to, to do. And, um, and then that led to the kind of ultimate pattern that you see here represented on the left. Um, the, but the interesting thing is it's really a point in time. It's, it's something that would be a process that we would um, frame but not constrain. The other part of the, of the project involved looking at lower Manhattan and specifically the edge from you know, roughly um, the north side of Battery Park City all the way around to the Brooklyn Bridge and how to think about different strategies for um, uh, selectively allowing water in slightly as well as keeping water out using the same technique of creating these bermed edges. So these are just two of about five or six conditions. These are in the book that we modeled. Um, the top two uh, or four drawings are of um, battery, uh, the Battery Park condition where we thought it might be interesting to allow water to actually form tidal pools and come in further, but still using the berm outward of the existing land side uh, as a way of um, Again, preventing incremental sea level, incremental inundation. And then on the um, lower images there, the FDR drive uh, basically creating a building typology that would form a wall to the water and would be bermed up against and then would open to a space below the FDR drive, which is an existing elevated highway there. But again, both conditions to help to blunt the force of a storm uh, in the event of a storm, but then on a day-to-day -day basis address incremental sea level rise. So this uh, information was um, presented uh, at the uh, uh, Venice Biennale in the 2010 in the American Pavilion, coupled with um, people who were doing um, uh, related work at Louisiana State University, looking at the lower Mississippi and how that, uh, the implications of, of um, uh, uh, sort of creating, uh, re reconstituting land that has um, um, subsided or been lost because of all the various human uh, modifications that have been done in Louisiana, which is allowing for more uh, dangerous impacts from storms there. So 
there were um, a group of people from the Louisiana State University Coastal Sustainability Studio, and then our, our project as well was presented there in this space. The other thing that, that this work uh, led to was uh, an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art and this book, that's the cover of the book, um, that uh, then took the documentation and the ideas that we presented in this part of planning framework, but engaged uh, five teams of uh, architects and engineers and their other chosen collaborators uh, to consider how these different zones of the harbor, which are different in their morphology, uh, how, they would, uh, how they could be developed in the future. And we, uh, our firm was in zone zero, again, lower Manhattan. So I'm going to be showing you the work we did there in a moment. So what was interesting about the Rising Currents exhibition and that's the catalog that was put out for the uh, exhibition, was that it involved workshops which engaged uh, the public at PS1, which is uh, part of MoMA in Long Island City. And uh, so two or three workshops where teams presented their projects in a kind of open house and got feedback from the public as well as from a number of government uh, officials, both state and, and um, city officials. So it was really very exciting, and, and, and also a lot of sharing of information amongst the teams as well. So it was very unusual, and Barry Bergdahl, who was the curator at MoMA at the time, has written about this. And uh, just to me, it really incredible that MoMA would sort of foster that and, and think about an issue like this. And the impact that that had was just remarkable in terms of an audience that would not normally be exposed, that would tend to think of this as being something that you'd see at a science museum, or that it's not somehow a cultural condition we have to be thinking about. So these are images from uh, four of the other teams, uh, LTL architects on the upper left, um, uh, Kate Orff and Scape on the upper right, uh, Matthew Baird, a lower right, and then N architects, the lower left. And these are some just images of the installation. So a lot of different uh, visual materials were used, physical models, uh, videos, uh, two-dimensional information, of course. Um, and some of it dynamic. Uh, the low, this image here uh, is LTL's project, which was in Hoboken. And what was interesting about their project was they're in an area where basically a two-foot rise in sea level floods the entire area. There's nothing. It's all landfill. So they really had uh, this sort of um, necessity, I guess, to say, uh, to kind of create a kind of program. So they called it waterproofing ground and uh, shaped that area of landfill into a series of almost... Uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, like sort of, not a test tube, but a, um, a uh, petri dish, a series of petri dishes that, that you would have different water conditions and could test different types of vegetation, different approaches to how to uh, uh, adapt to this tidal condition. And their model was actually very dynamic. It was an image projected on showing the impact of this uh, rising water in those areas. So the project that we developed uh, for Lower Manhattan was done in collaboration with Susanna Drake, who's a landscape architect and principal of a firm called D-Land Studio in New York. And um, this is where we really began to think about sort of the full watershed of Lower Manhattan. So unlike the first project, which was really a kind of constructed uh, solution projected out into this flooded zone, or the second project, which was really thinking about from the water side into land, this was thinking about in both directions. And again, our study area, Lower Manhattan. And again, similar to the start of our City of the Future project, thinking about the historical morphology of Lower Manhattan. And important uh, image is here, which is that unlike what we experience today in Manhattan, uh, there was a gradient. There was this sloped edge, which uh, is a natural way of, of allowing for the dynamic condition of water flow to occur and minimizing damage to buildings uh, and to structures uh, on land because of that. So these are some uh, early images. Uh, landfill fairly early on, uh, but kind of this highly constructed infrastructure, both for um, sewage uh, as well as um, to keep the water out uh, kind of in a very controlled fashion. Uh, this is an image from a French um, engineering, but sort of gets that idea across, but that's a cross-section through the seawall, combination of massive granite blocks and concrete 
which by the early 20th century was completely encircled Manhattan. And then in the, by the mid-century, uh, 20th century, Manhattan was fringed by these docks. And by the way, that was part of our inspiration as well for the City of the Future project, this kind of uh, uh, edge condition. But with um, containerized shipping, uh, all of the economics of this uh, disappeared. And so by sort of the early 1960s, all commercial shipping uh, moved to uh, Port of Elizabeth, New Jersey, and elsewhere. So it, with a very small presence still in, um, in Brooklyn and Red Hook. But um, so this kind of layered, layering out from the original um, land form to the current edge created a kind of disconnection between what, what is now currently a parkland rings the edge of, of, of the island, uh, but one that's not well connected back spatially to the interior of the city because historically um, this commercial edge was just not something that the public was allowed to visit at all. So it's the land of, you know, on the waterfront, the great movie with Marlon Brando. It was kind of a dangerous place uh, and not one that was open to the public. Now we're, we're going there, but it's not really well integrated. Uh, spatially and experientially into the city. So that was one of our premises for the project. And we thought about, with respect to uh, urban climate change adaptation, we thought about two things that are, two or three things that are happening now. One is uh, CSO outflow. So the diagram on the uh, far left are called combined sewer outflows or outfalls, which are places where when a small amount of rainwater falls in the city, it overwhelms the combined storm and sanitary sewer and you essentially have effluent going into the harbor. So hundreds of millions of gallons of, of uh, effluent go into the harbor every year because the city can't absorb this water fast enough. It mixes with the, um, in the sewage system and then that, uh, because the sewage treatment plants can't handle that volume, they, uh, it's uh, shunted out into the river. So it never goes swimming uh, after a rainstorm, by the way, in New York. Small uh, point of information. Um, but uh, And then the center image is incremental rise. So with a six-foot rise in sea level, that's what happens to the edge of, uh, that's the amount of flooding that occurs. Roughly 20% of lower Manhattan is flooded. And then with a storm surge on top of that, a Category 2 storm surge, which is actually not uh, unusual for uh, this area, about 60% of lower Manhattan floods. So we were looking at this present condition of water quality and CSO outflow, and then both incremental rise and storm surge. And so what we looked at in that diagram on the upper right is the watershed, water in, water out. What we looked at was basically a network of streets that could absorb, uh, distribute, and collect uh, this uh, rainwater, as well as um, uh, be responsive to inundation for, on a more um, uh, infrequent I I case from a storm surge, as well as um, a fringe or an edge of freshwater and saltwater wetlands that could process this runoff and clean it before it uh, goes back into the harbor. This would be in combination with other techniques like blue roofs and certain code changes that are already implemented in New York that require slowing down the rate of flow of water from a building roof into the sewage system. And so we calculated that you needed approximately 80 acres of these wetlands to process the, the runoff from this area. And then we thought of our project as really a series of sections uh, where we would redevelop, uh, kind of develop an ecological infrastructure that would work in parallel with uh, kind of constructed infrastructure, power, water, uh, sewage, data below the street. So this, we conceived of our project as a series of sections uh, and then used photo montage and really looked at designing the public realm, public space, and not new buildings, unlike our first, the City of the Future project. I thought about this as a public space, uh, um, uh, an urban design project. And I'll show a few of these now. So this is a, a, a street um, that and then I guess we th we also thought that given the amount of uh, that Lower Manhattan is well served by public transportation, that um, the presence of automobiles could be decreased. So you could take space formerly allocated for parking and begin to um, use it for as bioswales and other places to uh, have vegetation that could absorb runoff. We moved the and used the street bed itself as a, a kind of sponge to absorb this. 
uh, runoff and then move the utilities to spaces under the sidewalks. So this is a category one street, which is up to the full extent of uh, this uh, uh, storm surge to absorb and distribute water. Uh, category two streets to uh, distribute this water further. This is, um, again, another image of an existing building in lower Manhattan with these uh, streetscape. And then uh, category three streets, which would have um, some capacity below the street bed to store some of this water. So gray, gray uh, infrastructure where it, where it could be stored um, uh, until it could be uh, released back into the uh, wetlands. So to not overwhelm the wetlands. And then along the edge of the island, um, a series of uh, constructed edges and berms using the same technique that I showed earlier, but that would prevent incremental inundation from the incremental rise in sea level up to uh, about, we put in about a six foot berm. So that on a daily basis, because of the tide, you wouldn't have water entering into the, into the city. And then these highlands, similar idea, uh, not developed in the same way for this project at the south, southern end of Manhattan. We built a large model that um, was in the center of the exhibition space and uh, as well as these photo montage cross sections, isometric views that I didn't show, and a series of small videos that look at um, different types of um, plant life and, and birds and fish that begin to be um, uh, populate basically these, these uh, areas along the edge of the island. This is the existing seawall actually here, and sort of how that's been surmounted by this new uh, raised edge. And then on the east side of Manhattan, we actually proposed extending the city by one block to the east um, and to um, create a different type of edge condition because the East River is shallower, closer uh, to the city there, to the uh, uh, edge of the uh, building area. So this has a, a different condition. I should say the other proposition we had, which was a little bit um, provocative, I suppose, was to notch out and create, because of the depth of the Hudson, you can't create wetlands uh, there. So we, we created these crenellations, we call them these notches, that allowed us to create wetlands on that side. But the idea was, even though you were losing, and, and these existing buildings uh, edges where Battery Park City has come to the pier head line of those old historic piers, and um, north of this area, the thought was that you could continue to build the city out to that pier head line and so the net effect is you would have essentially more developable area, but also create these wetlands that would be uh, interspersed between these built out areas. So the, the final result on uh, this uh, photo montage, obviously of Lower Manhattan, the, the clouded buildings are actually new structures, some of which weren't built at the time, like tower number one, which is subsequently being completed. But the idea being, again, that, that the city would perpetuate itself in this uh, location through um, this kind of new uh, union, a kind of ecological infrastructure and this union of, of, uh, of culture and nature, if you will. Um, subsequently, and I'll show just a few things that we've done uh, subsequently, we were, um, uh, before wrapping up and sort of reflecting upon the implications of this work, but. Um, Sandy, uh, October 2012, so uh, catastrophic for you know the whole Northeast, um, and uh, we were um, asked to be part of a team for uh, to evaluate the impact of uh, uh, FEMA of, of implementing FEMA regulations on housing typologies in New York City. So we we were part of a team led by Arab and a firm called Boston Consulting Group to look at the economic and technical implications of uh, how to um, uh, uh, bring, FEMA, bring these buildings into FEMA compliance, which is essentially in many cases impossible. So, um, so there's some serious societal negotiations that are going to be happening that have already started to happen uh, in the wake of this storm. But essentially, um, the city has relaxed some zoning subsequent to this. Our work was then formed part of a uh, flood response book that the city planning department created. But cities relaxed some zoning requirements to allow you to build higher and so that you can take 
into account that the lower level of a building might not be usable anymore and, um, and some other techniques like that. But, and certainly for new buildings, you can build them you know, on, on piles or piers that are higher. But this study basically took this, looked at tw approximately 20 um, different housing typologies and then applied these uh, FEMA requirements, which are really developed for like coastal areas that are not populated heavily uh, and, and, and saw how you could, what the impact would be. So a lot, lot more questions than answers in that work. And then some projects that we did, some of which were concurrent uh, with that work. So this is actually, interestingly, while we were doing the work uh, for um, rising currents, we were also involved in a brownfield site uh, on the Hudson River with Reed Hildebrand, landscape architects, to take uh, an existing um, uh, edge in Beacon, New York, about 65 miles north of Manhattan. And we created a new boat pavilion there, as well as renovated a historic structure, which both of which sit within the floodplain. So these were subsequently flooded for both, her, both uh, Irene, which was in 2011, which was a, a severe storm, and then Sandy in 2012, uh, both of which are, you know, were not, were not damaged. But this, the barn, for instance, integrates flood vents and some other techniques to uh, address water as well as a high water table. You wouldn't be allowed to build a building like that, at that in that way, uh, but it was existing and it was grandfathered in. Uh, and then we've also done one recently completed project in Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is on the lower right, uh, which is the renovation of a uh, former Department of Environmental Protection water quality lab into a public uh, space and maintenance and operations building for the park, and then something that Will Smith contributed to here on the, uh, the two center and right-hand image, which is a new boathouse and maintenance and operations building that are part of the Pier 5 Uplands, which is the next phase of Brooklyn Bridge Park. So for those of you who haven't been to um, New York City or haven't been to Brooklyn Bridge Park, I recommend visiting it because there are a number of different techniques for both allowing you to actually get down and sort of touch the water, which is not something you can do easily in Manhattan, but also to allow for water to come in, you know, the tide to, to have a place to come in and, and, and out of. So as a kind of new paradigm for an urban park, it's pretty uh, exciting uh, place to see. So the two buildings on the, in the right hand, left hand side will be, have just started construction. They'll be finished uh, early next year. Uh, and this one is open now. And then a project that's just actually another project that Will was involved in, uh, at least the initial information gathering stage of. Uh, but actually, I can't show you images of it, which are now done. But this is a site plan of a new visitor center um, adjacent to the uh, FDR um, Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island. So in each case here and the projects in Brooklyn as well as in Beacon, uh, building proximate to the water and kind of getting a firsthand look even at this relatively small scale at the implications of how you create structures that can, um, that can literally be built from a regulatory standpoint and also just how to make them more resilient and responsive um, to this, this condition. And then finally, I'm uh, teaching a studio this semester with two other colleagues at University of Virginia looking at the Norfolk area uh, and placing a very large program in this zone. Norfolk is similar to um, Miami and some other areas where it's already experiencing flooding from high tides and a condition that's only going to get worse in the future. And so they're, they're one of um, a network called 100 Resilient Cities that is um, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and sort of beginning to develop strategies and approaches to, um, to envision a future you know, in, this, in this context. So this is just an image from Climate Central's uh, website. They have an amazing mapping tool if you're interested and in, uh, go to their website. Uh, and then lots of other resources related to um, not just urban climate change adaptation, but, but other implications of uh, this. So I want to just quickly reflect, uh, have like four or five minutes left, just on implications for architecture. and. A lot of this is actually going to echo the discussion on the panel last night, so, uh, but, which was great that these, some of these things came up. But they've, they are things that, that we've thought about, I think, in many cases before beginning these projects, but also had these um, beliefs strengthened through our work um, on this, these projects. So one is just 
thinking about context as a complex ecology. These are a series of images that are from our Palisade Bay project, but look at all of the kind of rich um, uh, uh, life that occurs in this kind of gradient condition uh, ecosystem, uh, whether plant life, birds, uh, uh, invertebrates, et cetera. Um, and this notion of context being uh, both complex but also a set of relationships, so something that we try to understand fully and develop through the work that we do uh, is really important, and I think that's been manifest in what I showed. But the other thing being that, especially with climate, with uh, sea level rise, thinking about a continuum so that there's a dynamic condition and that the boundaries of that condition are not prescribed. So. Um, the boundaries between land and water are blurred or are dynamic, I think is particularly interesting and leads to different approaches. Then it leads you to try to frame processes, as I'll talk about, rather than prescribe sort of finite uh, results. The other fundamental thing, which is really we've thought about since we started our firm 23 years ago, is thinking about a design as a form of inquiry. So. We come to projects with questions, not answers uh, necessarily, although we have specific ideas that we want to explore oftentimes, but we're open to learning from the information that we engage. And so these are, you know, that's manifest in everything. I, I hope what I showed in different ways. These are just a few snapshots of that island. But the notion that, you know, research is a process of testing ideas, making hypotheses, um, seeing whether or not they're, you know, withstand. Um, testing, whether it's visual testing uh, from an aesthetic standpoint or performance relative to how you want them to function, whether it's about social relationships or uh, uh, environmental relationships. The other uh, is collaboration. So uh, this is a diagram of all of the web of collaborations that came out of that initial AIA uh, Latrobe grant. And, uh, and they're still continuing to this day. So the, like a ripple in a pond, the, all of the Rebuild by Design projects, a number of the participants in that uh, post-Sandy were a part of this process, uh, these, these relationships. So um, collaboration for us is a way to um, connect expertise to action so that um, through, and, and also inform you know, uh, our process of inquiry. So we, we um, strongly believe in that and, and think it's essential to make architecture that can actually engage in a meaningful way the, con the kind of complex context that it's a part of. Uh, breadth is something we talked about, breadth and depth last night. So breadth is interesting to us because um, we find, we get excited in our work about detail as much as we do about larger strategic planning, uh, the implications of larger strategic planning processes. And these are two projects, again, that went on simultaneous with our Latrobe and Rising Currents work, one which is a passive house in upstate New York, so it's kind of micro scale dealing with how do you mitigate climate change by reducing you know, uh, fossil fuels through reducing energy consumption, and then uh, the other being uh, a large planning framework for the area just north of the study area we had for Lower Manhattan, which was to reconnect uh, the Greenwich South neighborhood of Manhattan to uh, the rest of the city. So. Doing that at the same time we think is really important. And that breadth also encompasses just the way in which people live today so that there isn't a finite line between city and country or between home and office. Um, we think that this diversity and, and breadth of work um, allows us to gain insight into how people utilize and experience space. Uh, depth, I mean, this is literal depth here. In some cases, this is uh, bathymetry. But the idea of, someone asked about you know, the depth. I think what's intriguing to me about the idea of studying something in detail is that you get greater specificity, and that specificity can make it uh, more powerfully connect to its place uh, or to the nature in which how people utilize uh, um, space or, or a building uh, if, it's, if it's architecture. So that depth of study um, to create layers of, of experience and specificity that's tuned to that, we think is really important. Uh, designing the process, again, um, we think of that, you know, we tend to think that as architects or designers, we sort of are, we arrive at a situation and we're simply to, you know, do our part, do what's expected of us. 
but we, we, need, we should be mindful of the fact that we actually can help frame the process itself. So something I mentioned on the panel discussion last night, we've, almost every project we do now, we do very extensive programming and pre-design to help define what the project actually is. Even if the client thinks they already know what it is, we really we usually engage to help them develop that. Uh, it obviously has some practical um, aspects in terms of uh, budget and, and um, helping them understand you know, whether their resources can, can, can fit in a, given, uh, in a given place. But it also ultimately allows us um, to um, help direct design in the most effective ways possible. What was great about the MoMA process, as I said before, was just that uh, rising currents was that the, the museum got involved as part of this and that it was exposed and open to the public in a way that was unusual. And I would argue that a lot of the, I think it was very evident that post Sandy in New York, many of the elected officials who had participated in this were already highly sensitized to um, the potential that this approach could have to the city. And so the response that within, you know, roughly eight months after Sandy, the SUR report, which is also a special initiative on rebuilding and reconstruction, which was uh, issued uh, in June or July of 2013, could not have happened as quickly if there wasn't a kind of consensus about a layered approach which incorporated many of these elements. And that happened because of the openness and transparency of this process. Um, feedback loops, it's um, hard to describe exactly, but to say that when we did the two-year Latrobe research, we started thinking about design only a few months into the process and began testing propositions as we began to gather information. So um, we don't think about the design process as being strictly a linear um, thing, but that it actually has, although of course it progresses and you reach points of greater resolution, but that there's also um, productive feedback loops and that the information you create can be tested along the way. So this was a set of diagrams just looking at island formation. Obviously the upper left image there, uh, very hard to navigate that harbor there, but began to just think about, you know, what's the scale of an island? How does that relate to uh, the, the water? And, and consider um, these elements not just from their performative function, but also their kind of physical reality and visualize that early on. Um, the temporal dimension is something I talked about, so related to both daily tidal flow, uh, storm surge, currents in this case, these are stills from movies that we, sh or um, video that we shot of the water table. Uh, it's something that we think about. We believe you know, in our architecture um, that ideas are understood directly through how you use and experience the space, and the way you do that is over time. So through qualitative experience of, of your own movement, uh, of how uh, lighting uh, changes. Uh, it could be the time of the year, time of day. So that's, it's also something that, of course, landscape architects have known for a long time, which is that um, you know, the end of their projects typically is the beginning of when they start to function. So this is something that we've, we've had amazing good fortune to collaborate with a number of great landscape architects. And this has only been reinforced by working with them and understanding that it's not something you tend to think about as an architect. And, and someone mentioned that, I think, in the discussion yesterday, that you know the building being an endpoint versus being a starting point. And then communication, this is a really bad image. You know, I couldn't find, for some reason, the actual video that we shot of all this water, which was used not only in our City of the Future, but then Momo used it in the, in the exhibition, and we used it in Venice. But this is a still from that. But the point, so this isn't doing a great job of communicating, but the, the point was that we, you know, who's the audience? And, and so how do you impact, how can you make something impactful by understanding the audience, but also making it accessible through a range of different techniques of, of communication. So it's not just graphic techniques of drawing types, but it's also narrative in the case of the city of the future, which told a story that, you know, you didn't even have to understand plan to understand, to engage or to um, enter into. And then, and, then, and then this kind of quality of, of movement and fluidity that was brought into the exhibition there. So that's kind of essential precursor to um, making impact is figuring out how to communicate and doing it on a n number of levels. And then um, again, framing the problem. So um, examples of uh, coming into situations where, you know, it wasn't a given that, that we would be looking at 
uh, climate change adaptation in Manhattan, the nine other teams that we worked with looked at or that were our competitors looked at completely different things. So we thought about that was an opportunity to frame a, a problem. Or the notion of in the center of Palisade Bay, this kind of regional center, that was a, a, a means of mobilizing thought you know, by, by considering this place as having uh, a kind of physical presence and how that could be uh, uh, understood within the region. And then finally, public space, and thinking about that uh, in, in the rising currents ex, uh, image as well. So I guess the last thing I'll say is just that, and reflecting back on this climate change work in general, I think um, when we presented the city of the future, uh, Billy Tsen, who was one of the jurors, asked us if our project was elegiac or optimistic, because it had a kind of dark uh, side. It was this flickering, bluish light. And, and we thought that, and uh, it was actually both. We were, we were striving, and this, her question was very perceptive, and we hadn't really reflected upon how this would be received. But I think what's elegiac about um, urban climate change adaptation is that it forces us to think about the permanence of what we build uh, very differently than how we've been trained or how society has created cities, that cities are going to become something that change over time and maybe within our own lifetimes. So there's something in a way sad about that. And it's if you've, you know, uh, because that story you saw, you know, maybe at the, you know, when you were growing up is no longer on the corner or, um, you know, the neighborhood's a little bit different. Um, but the optimism, I think, is that there can become a kind of, uh, really incredible revelatory um, relationship between ourselves and the world around us. And in fact, to echo what um, uh, last night's presentation, um, uh, one of the presentations yesterday was th there really shouldn't be any kind of boundary between ourselves and the world around us. So there's a kind of unity that, that is kind of exciting and, and maybe uh, revelatory uh, compared to the current state that we're in. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if we could get maybe one or two questions to fit within five minutes, um, just have a panel right after this, but I'd love to give you the opportunity to ask Adam a couple things. So, any questions? Can we get some lights on? Some lights. Um, One of the interesting um, 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 processes that's happening now is the Rebuild by Design program that uh, HUD did subsequent to Sandy. So if you look online at their website, they had a number of teams um, uh, that were selected through a competition that had different study areas. And there was a tremendous amount of public engagement on a very grassroots level uh, within each of those study areas. And so there's both a, a publication that you can download that's free or just look at the projects online. But it's interesting in terms of that's a very direct, um, uh, what you're describing is beginning to happen now um, on, on both a local level and urban level. And also the SIR report for that the city of New York published describes a layered approach that involves, on the one hand, large-scale engineering infrastructure that some of which is flood barriers, as well as more neighborhood scale um, interventions that can help compartmentalize and uh, make for a more resiliency in the event of a storm. So it's a combination of different techniques, but some of it I think just is going to happen incrementally. You know, for all we know, there'll be another severe storm, you know, next fall during the hurricane season. And uh, so it's, it's, um, People are more sensitized to the problem than before. The other thing that's happened post Sandy is that there was a there's a federal law that uh, 
subsidized uh, flood insurance for people living in the flood zones, and that was uh, grandfathered out. It happened to coincide roughly with when Sandy occurred. It's called the Bigger Waters Act. And so the fact that people uh, are living in a flood zone and may have had a severely damaged building and now can't get flood insurance or potentially a mortgage from a bank is causing there to be a kind of negotiation process that's happening. Um, so in, even in New York City, um, and there were just articles in the last few months about this, Staten Island um, had a particularly hard hit neighborhood where some, one, some parts of the neighborhood have decided to relocate. But they couldn't reach a consensus with other people, so some people are, the city is, or the state is, is going to finance rebuilding in other parts. But I think it's just a process of negotiation that's going to happen over the next, you know, dec uh, decades. Uh, and it won't be, because we're a democracy, you know, this just has to work itself out. But I think the market forces, uh, for better or worse, are going to expedite it. And I think what they'll do, at least from our study of uh, housing, uh, post-Sandy housing, is that uh, single family or duplex dwellings that were in flood zones are have a crosshairs on them <laughs> because it's just not tenable. Um, and many of the ones that were damaged in New York City in um, Brooklyn and um, Rockaways were in areas that were not complying with zoning and were overbuilt anyway, and the city had turned a blind eye to those. Those can't even be rebuilt uh, by today's standards. So, but larger buildings uh, can be. The challenges are with a large condo or something is that you, you lose ec um, uh, revenue from ground floor spaces that can't be there. So, you know, or if it's the super's apartment or something. So that, that's a challenge in some condos that are not economically strong to begin with. So anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's just going to be this messy thing. And I also think as designers, the rebuild by design is really great to show kind of this very deliberate process of engagement that, um, and it's described in a fair amount of detail there. So, yeah, yep. Um, you, uh, the idea of a combination of techniques seems right, but do we know, for example, the relative effectiveness of the islands versus the green streets in mitigating uh, storm surges? Well, one of the things that has to happen is pilot projects that actually test this full scale. <clears throat> so the city is doing post the Latrobe work. They have done a green infrastructure plan for New York City. And they're also piloting bioswales and street, enhanced street tree pits and other techniques to capture and actually start to measure what their capacity is. So there needs to be more information. I think in that respect, a lot of what we showed was based upon things we researched from other applications and then postulated that they could be effective here. But and Guy mentions when he talks about the project, you know, he's a structural engineer by training, but he says that this uh, coastal um, resiliency design is in a way where earthquake engineering was maybe 60 or 70 years ago, when there wasn't a clear correlation between soil, uh, land, you know, um, geology and uh, structural typology, and that it's come in a tremendous way, and now that and structural engineers can actually design in terms of uh, soil types, and so. He feels like, with, as more research is done, there'll be similar capacity to design, you know, for the parameters and to judge whether they're effective or not. So, yeah, this is just like the little cusp of a process, but because we don't really know exactly um, that. One of the things that's been great, the city of New York has done, is start to do more pilot projects, just so that the appetite for the public can be wet before you've made massive investments, and at the same time, you can test these things. So they're doing some of those things now, yeah. And then some of the stuff is really straightforward. Like, they've put collars on all the subway gratings that are in the flood flooding areas in lower Manhattan and certain parts of Queens, because they just know that, you know, if you have a six-inch collar on the vent in the sidewalk, that will keep out X amount of water. So some of that's very, you know, obvious, and they're, they're doing that. Uh, we gotta move along, but I'm just gonna give the panel uh, about 20 minutes on sort of designers' responsibility in the face of climate change. So I'd love to see you all there. Thanks again. Thank you.